Hello and welcome to the 24th episode of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And today we're talking about philosophical approaches to physics in the early modern generation. I guess. I guess it's not generation. Early modern era. Era. Era is a better term, Mm -hmm. not generation. Yes, so I guess we should get right into it unless you have something you want to to add going into this. Uh, I think this is probably the last... Isn't this the last era where there is a philosophy of physics? I believe so. So from here on out, uh, physics is its own completely separate thing apart from philosophy. Yeah, no deep thoughts. Yeah. So this will be the last time we ever talk about physics. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, there are compelling philosophical issues with regard to physics, but you have to be a physicist first. Yes, I would agree. And we are not even close to that. Not at all. We're not even, well, I'm not a philosopher. You're a philosopher. <laughs> I'm not a philosopher. We're yeah. all philosophers. You have a degree in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certified. Yeah, you're a certified philosopher. Certified. <laughs> yes, but that, right. that means nothing. So, starting off here, we're talking about natural philosophy. So, here at the beginning of this early modern era, uh, philosophy was very much split. It was split into philosophy of natural science and science of physics. So the science of physics was very much the mathematical, you know, the very strictly scientific approach to, uh, to physics and studying the world, whereas the philosophy of natural science um, really did incorporate a lot of those old beliefs about philosophy in terms of the world. And so uh, Anthony Kenny kind of describes here, uh, of course, the author of this book, uh, that the, the liberation of physics from philosophy also led to an impoverishment of philosophy. Um, you know, I guess we should be mentioning sometime in our podcast that that we're going chapter by chapter for the for the, uh, through Anthony Kennedy's yes. history. We we'll mentioned that in the, in the very beginning, but yeah. I feel like we yeah. fail to mention that yeah. every episode. And so if, if somebody came in at like episode fifteen, they would have never known. And we're like, what is they referring to? Yes, that's what we're referring. Yes, to. that's what we're referring to. So <laughs> in case you've jumped in the middle of it, we're reading Anthony Kennedy's A New History of Western Philosophy. Go back to the beginning. If they, if they didn't start at the beginning, they got to go oh, back. Oh, yes. I thought, you were talking, I thought you were talking to me. I'm like, no. I don't, I don't want to go back oh, to the beginning man. of this book. Sheesh, yeah. We are more than halfway. That's about two-thirds of the way through. about two-thirds of the way through, yeah. Ooh, yes. pages, about a thousand. Yeah. So like I was saying, um, with this liberation of physics from philosophy, Anthony Kenny kind of says that there's this impoverishment of philosophy because there's this very much turn away from Aristotle at this time. Um, whereas uh, Aristotle used to be held in very high regard in all fields of philosophy, there's very much this approach that um, he's very much outdated. We shouldn't take as much from Aristotle going forward. Yeah, what do you think of that? I don't know. He kind of points out the problems with that a little bit later in this reading, so right. I think we'll get into that a little bit. Although I do like this quote from Aristotle, which he's trying to use to uh, bolster you know, his value, Aristotle's value, where he says... Uh, or Aristotle had said, we must trust observation rather than theory, and trust theories only if the results conform to the observed phenomena, mm-hmm. which is true. Yes. Aristotle's a smart dude. Yes, he's very smart. And so uh, with this kind of, um, not like you were saying, this belief in observation, uh, a lot of Aristotle's works were kind of misinterpreted here in this early modern era because it's very much a text-based society because Anthony Kenny kind of points out that, you know, it's very much all the religions at this time were very much you look at the text of the religion, either the Bible, the Quran, um, the Torah, that sort of thing. And that's that's it. That is the word and that is it. And so that's when you're an getting interesting, interesting way to look at uh, mm-hmm. the thinkers at the time. Yeah. And so when you're getting these, you know, these works of Aristotle, um, you know, they're kind of reading it as this is the way it is or it isn't. You know, it's not right. so much that um, you can take bits and pieces. And it's not so much that you need to rely on observations. Just if it's in the text or if it's not in the text, that's the way it is. It's almost like if you know it you believe it mm-hmm. kind of thing. If you read it in these, these accepted texts, then it's dogma. I yeah. Guess. Interesting. And so Anthony kind of, kind of breaks down um, really kind of the four big um, looks at the approach to, to physics here. Uh, he kind of mentions that Aristotle very much relied on a priori, uh, a priori, something like that. Uh, knowledge, meaning, you know, kind a of the... A priori. A priori. Isn't it? Probably. I think that's what we said last time because yes. I was brought up with Kant. At least I'm uh, Kant. Kant. <laughs> so so it's very much you know the, the the belief that we have these internal truths uh things that we kind of just know about the world uh intrinsically um and then that kind of very much differs in descartes uh, he believed that science imitates math and that it should look for truths with immediate immediate intuitive appeal so he kind of takes that step you know we should be looking at mathematics we should be looking at science in these terms of things but he really um did not think that math was inherently you know in every single aspect of science he thought that science should reflect math uh in, the, in kind of counting, you know, how counting is immediate, you know, appeal. It's very simple, that sort of thing. That's the things we should be looking for in science. 
um, which is a very interesting, very strange, I think, approach to science saying that, you know, we should only look for the most, you know, immediate intuitive things that make sense and not so much dig too much further. Is that really what he's saying? That's how I read it. I don't know. You're also not exactly talking into your mic, so I think you're a little quiet. Am I Jesus. better that's now? That's not what... <laughs> Sorry about that. A very abrupt stop. Um, as he was trying to make himself louder, he accidentally unplugged the entirety of the setup. So <laughs> that's that's what happened. If you now. can't hear me, no one can hear anything. Yeah, that's now, uh, now I am talking almost on top of the microphone so that you can hear me. Can you hear me now? Now it looks like we're split into two separate channels. That's all right. We're both being recorded in some fashion. That's never happened before. Interesting. Maybe that's the way it should be. All right, back to what we were talking our about. Our quality just doubled. I Or our errors were cut in half, one or the other. Maybe. I don't know. I'm probably <laughs> sounding in like the right side of somebody's headphones, and you're probably sounding in the left side. Well, it's like a 1970s album yeah, action yeah. there. We're, we're talking on either side of you. I wonder if we can, can like zoom from one side to the other. I also think it might just be like Led Zeppelin. all combined into one mono recording after I edit it all down. So mm. maybe nothing would have happened. Anyway, back to what we were talking about after that very abrupt break. Um, one of the other very important kind of scientists in looking at physics here is uh, Francis Bacon, of course, and he believed that mathematics was kind of this appendix to science, not so much that it's uh, entirely involved with science, but it's kind of this additional thing that you can kind of stick on to the end of science. Um, so that's where he kind of differed from Descartes and from Aristotle. And then finally, Galileo, uh, Anthony Kenny kind of points to having this full understanding of the, the science and mathematics interacting he fully appreciated the role of math, uh, but he did not fully appreciate that hypothesis is just confirmed and not proved with certainty. Boy, that's that's something that, that we should teach everybody in America mm-hmm. and across the world today, especially, well, especially with regard to like global warming theories and all these other major um, theories that, that people are espousing now. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're acting as if it's gospel because a whole bunch of scientists said, well, that's what the way it is. Well, that... And first of all, they're not even predictive anyway, because, mm-hmm. you know, 20 years ago they were saying, you know, all this stuff was going to melt and they didn't. So actually it's been disproven by standard scientific theory because there was a hypothesis, there was observation, there was a prediction. Prediction did not come true mm-hmm. and therefore it's been refuted. Yes. But be that as it may, too many people think that if you just have a hypothesis and it's confirmed once, that, that it's proven mm-hmm. absolutely true beyond yeah. any doubt. But it just means that you've confirmed that theory, mm-hmm. and then you just want to keep confirming it to make sure that it's still valid over mm-hmm. time. That's kind of where Kenny says he, where Galileo got into a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. Not so much that he was, you know, trying to prove a hypothesis, but that he took this hypothesis, found it to be true in this one experiment that he did, and then proclaimed it to be fact, which the church did not like. But they also just did not like his ideas in general, so that was also a big deal. Yeah, and I, I yeah, I think. Well, he's saying it's confirmed. Yes. I don't know that he said it's like God, you know, I don't know, maybe he did. I'm trying to think. I don't know. But I, I, even if he just said what's been confirmed and you guys are all wrong, mm-hmm. I think that's, that's he would probably been in the same spot if, he, yeah. even if Kenny's right about, well, he, he didn't prove it true. It's mm-hmm. just a confirmation. Yeah. Tomato, tomato at that point. Mm-hmm. Moving on to Cartesian physics. Yeah, I thought we saw it. I talked about that. No, not yet. Okay. So Descartes uh, really set up this mecha- mechanistic, mechanistic physical system. So that's the belief that all natural phenomena can be explained by motion of geometrical matter. And he also believed that a body can lose any of its properties besides extension. So what really makes a thing a thing is its dimensions, basically. It's, it's mass. It's um, form, I guess you could say. So he kind of points to the example like, uh, you know, if you grind down a stone, you know, it can become a powder. It's no longer hard. It loses that property of itself, but it still has that same... Um, property of extension it still physically exists in a space he also kind of points to fire i think um you know saying that a fire can be can be dimmer or brighter um so that's not inherently part of it but it still keeps its same you know space it keeps, it keeps its same extension yeah i think that's full baloney but yes it becomes yeah. very much uh disproven here very, very uh, unwieldy and and um overly simple and complicated at the same time mm-hmm and so he also very much denied the existence of a vacuum. Any sort of right. void he believed was impossible because, uh, you know, everybody would have to act on another body in order for anything to happen. And so then he also kind of got into this theory that all movement is circular. So he kind of says that, you know, for any, for, for object. I think, I think his reasoning is circular. 
It, it, it very much is. Uh, so he kind of says that if, you know, for object B to move, A must move it first, and then B would move C, and then eventually you'd get back all the way to Z, pushing A again so that all, all, all motion is circular because there's nothing else for anything to move through um, right. besides another body. Right. So all motion would have to be circular in the end. He also very much opposed the atomic hypothesis. Uh, he said that matter must be infinitely divisible because that's very much contingent on his whole theory that everything only matters upon its extension, right? And so right. if it's space, its form, its shape is really what defines an object. You can't just keep dividing it and dividing, or you can just keep dividing right. it and dividing it, sorry, um, because, you know, that's how it would keep its inherent uh, size. Right. Do you have any other thoughts on that besides right or that's baloney? Not not really. I mean, it's, it's an interesting mm-hmm. theory in the history of philosophy, but beside that, it's... It's as, better than what existed before, I would say, but... How so? Well, I don't think there was really anything before. Well, then how is it better if it's wrong? Isn't it better to not know something than to know something wrong? I think if the... As the, Reagan said, it's not the problem that liberals are, are wrong. No, how is it? It's not that... There was, I don't know, what is this quote? I do not know. It's it's not that they it's not that they don't know things. It's that the things they know are all wrong. <laughs> That's the quote or a paraphrasing of it. Yeah. And and so I think that if you just don't know something, you're better off than knowing it wrong. I mean, I think it's better if it's a step in the right direction. If there's bits and pieces that can help propel you to the right thing, I think it's better than knowing nothing. Hmm. I don't know. So I think some knowledge some knowledge is better than no knowledge. What if your knowledge is wrong, though? Well, then it's not knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't knowledge have to be true for it to be knowledge? That's interesting. I would say that it'd have to be true for it to be knowledge. Because otherwise it's just, just a lie or it's just but not if, a fact. But if you know something that, but that now, that, but your knowledge is wrong. Because then it's just a misconception. It's not knowing anything. You're hmm. just, you just don't know what you, what you don't know, I guess. Right. Yeah. That brings up the great philosophy of Donald Rumsfeld. Who's Donald Rumsfeld? Former Secretary of Defense during the first Bush Gulf War, where he was explaining to the media there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, there are unknown unknowns. And those are the ones you have to worry about. Hmm. Very, very wise. Because if you know in battle, yeah, especially in strategery, mm-hmm. it's important to know what you know, mm-hmm. and you have to know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. But really, you have to struggle with the the unknown unknowns. Yeah, because you don't know that you don't know those. You don't know that you have to know them. Yeah. Yes, and it's simple and also very deep, mm-hmm. much like the best I mean, bad movie ever made. We're not talking about Roadhouse, Roadhouse again. We're not talking about Roadhouse again. We're not doing this. I we, did I mention this in the podcast? Yes, several times. By the way, pain get, don't hurt. I'm yes, getting a yes. t-shirt uh, <laughs> delivered sometime this week. All right. That is the. Oh, double, you yo, you bought a Roadhouse d- shirt. Well, it's a double deuce. What? That's the name of the bar that he worked oh, as a bouncer at. Right. Double deuce. That's fantastic. Double I'm so, deuce I'm, Roadhouse. I'm, Hence the the name of the movie Roadhouse. I'm very happy for you, Dad. The worst bad movie. It's Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I don't. By the way, we got to finish uh, watching the third yes. movie of the, the trilogy. Of the yes, the second half of the third movie. Yes, for the never like ending, two hours. the never ending <laughs> climb up the uh, volcano of Mordor. It's not as long Mordor. as you remember it. Mordor. Mordor is fine. Okay. It's not as long as you remember it. I don't know. What, I have to time it. All right, that's fantastic. Getting back to philosophy, um, unless yes. there's something else you'd like to add about Roadhouse. Oh, well, I could always add Well, I should not have opened that up. Yes. Moving on to the atomism of Gassendi. Uh, so there's this revival of the atomism of Epicurus and Democritus back in ancient times. Which the, was... uh, the quote of, uh, on the t-shirt <laughs> underneath the double deuce is, we are nice until we are no longer, or it's until uh, we are going to be nice until it's time to not be nice. And then his big fat bouncer says, when, when do we know to be not nice? He says, I will tell you. All right. That's fantastic. <laughs> the atomism of Gassendi. So like I was saying, the ancient belief of Epicurus and Democritus mostly 
uh, the belief that the that all matter is made up of uh, infinitely small things. So these uh, very, very minuscule, tiny things that are indivisible. Um, and so it's Pierre Gassendi who and really they aggregated the molecules. Yes, and stuff like yes, that? that was Pierre Gassendi's yeah. kind of addition here. Uh, that natural. I don't, I don't remember ever studying anything about mm-hmm. it before. No, I don't I mean, remember in my, his name. in my history. You know, because I remember going over all of the different beliefs about atoms over time. Uh, the the Bohr model, the Ford model, a couple others. The Bishop, Adam. the Adam Bishop model. No, that, that's not a thing. So circa two thousand three. That's when I was born. Yes. Why? You're the Ad- Adam Bishop model. Adam. Adam. Oh. oh. <laughs> All right. So, so Gassendi believed that natural bodies are aggregates of indivisible small units of matter and that atoms move in a straight line unless they collide with other atoms or get incorporated into a larger unit, like you were saying, a molecule. So that's where uh, I guess he was the first person to propose this idea of a molecule. Is anybody else listening to this imagining Adam Bishop uh, running in a straight line and colliding with other people named Adam? I, I don't think anybody okay. knows what I look like who is listening to this, so I don't well, think they'd have a very hard time imagining it. We have it. a fan base out there. We, I don't know if you'd call it a fan base. <laughs> it's like two people. Well, very strong base. It's something. <laughs> We're very thankful for whoever does listen to this train wreck. So uh, he, Gassendi really believed that there was no motion unless there was a void or a vacuum uh, to move through because he believed that, you know, atoms, of course, move in a straight line and they can collide with each other. And so for anything to move, there has to be a vacuum to move through. Otherwise, the atoms would just collide and bounce off each other and there'd be no motion at all. Uh, and so he, so he also believed that space and time existed before creation. Uh, so this was kind of a almost a revolutionary idea, I would say. Um, at the time, yeah. In that, you know, he said, well, there has to be, you know, just a space for things to exist and there has to be a time for things to exist for anything to exist at all. Otherwise, you know, how would anything exist, basically? So before anything was even made, there had to be a space for it to exist and a time for it to exist. Kind of like you need um, a can of Play-Doh before you make a little Play-Doh guy. It has to, has to, has to have the raw material somewhere. I guess, yeah. I, I mean, and the space being the can. Although you don't really create your Play-Doh things within the can. But. No, not typically. All right. Well, that was a good analogy. It was something. Moving on to Newton. <laughs> so there's only a couple sections here about Newton, but... My uh, favorite cookie. Or is it a cake? Fig Newton? It's, it's like a pastry. Pastry? I don't know. It's not like pastry. I, don't know. I guess it's just a Fig Newton. I don't think it's a cookie or a cake. The little cake. <laughs> Why? <laughs> on to Fig Newton. All right. Yeah, so Newton... Uh, his really big uh, addition to the to the big scheme of physics was this universal law of gravitation, which big is that time, yeah. yeah, so that there's uh, objects are attracted to each other in proportion to their masses in an inverse proportion to the squares of the distance between them. So gravity, basically, so, you, you know, know what the, you should do. You're so smart. You should study physics and figure out why gravity exists. I don't think I'd be able to do that. Why not? If well, not you, then who? Well, I'm not exactly Evidently a physicist. No one. Yeah, I know that's no what I'm one. saying. I don't think because, I've, nobody else has been able to do it. Why can't you figure it out? You're a smart kid. Uh, I'm not interested in physics. Really, not at all. I mean, I guess I was. Yeah, I was I mean, just too lazy to pursue it. Interesting, I guess. Interesting. My yeah. physics class at school was not very good. So now you're in high school. Yeah. I don't know. It's a lot of math. I'm not exactly a, a math, math guy. Yeah, you're good at math. But yes. And so the isn't it interesting that we don't know why gravity works the way it is. Mm-hmm. And there's no, as they say, grand unified theory to explain all the forces. Yeah. Isn't it fascinating? They're that? working on it, though. They've been working on it for 100 years. I know. I mean, literally 100 years. Mm-hmm. After uh, Einstein's theory, theory of relativity, which was what? Early 1900s? 1918? He was, he was alive during World War II. Well, I That's know he was he alive, to, but he so was pretty he young. To America. He was pretty young, but when he did the theory of relativity, he was no, still, a, still a postal clerk answer. before he's a professor or anything. He hmm. wasn't even, he, he was basically a reject at that point. Huh. He was a civil servant and uh, did this on the side. And he got that paper published and then he became an academic because they're like, oh my God, this guy's right. I feel like that's what happens a lot of the time with these famous scientists is that they're rejected by a lot of people until they're... right. So we actually uh, watched a movie in psychology about uh, John Nash, um, who was, uh, well, he, he studied economics. Um, so he was, um, I'm trying to remember, like, the rule he made up is that, you know, the best benefit for everybody is when, um, you know, people act for what's best for themselves and for what's best for the group. Because, like, the law of mm-hmm. economics before that was, 
the best outcome is when everybody acts what's best for themselves. And he kind of stuck on that and what's best for the group uh, in order to, you know, uh, in, a, in a free market to, to make everything hmm. better. Fascinating. Yes. And then he, he was insane. Um, he saw people that were not there. And yeah. And then how, he, th- he. How do we know? What do you mean? How do we know they weren't there? Well, he, he made up this, this vision of, of a roommate he had in college that never actually existed. Hmm. And then later he envisioned his roommate's daughter that never actually existed. Fascinating. Then he, he made up this whole um, really just year spanning um you know misbelief that he was working for the government trying to track down uh soviet messages into the united states huh. when in reality he was just kind of like circling things at random in magazines yeah and so he kind of envisioned this you know cia you know government director dude telling him what to do but it was never any actual thing Isn't that wild yeah you know it, it, it's interesting when we, we don't have to really belabor that but it's always interested me how do you really know when someone's insane and then how and then and it's always so hard and i've represented a lot of a uh, fair number of people that are have been committed um and to talk to them about their paranoia or their delusions mm-hmm. it's, it's it's interesting to try to um and, and, and my representation it's not really part of my job but it's interesting to try to understand their delusion and then communicate with them about whether or not that's real, and and then they you know, they talk about insight, whether they have insight as to their mental illness, and most of them do, but some mm-hmm. of them, you know, they they really have a um, a belief and a perception of the world that's just completely wrong or different. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. So I think the definition of like a, a, a mental disorder is it has to negatively impact their life and the life of others around them. So. Either they're a danger to themselves or they're a hindrance to, you know, the, the normal goings on of people. So I think that's what is typically defined as a, as a disorder. You better be careful with that because you're diagnosing a lot of people in this country <laughs> right now and they don't like that. Well, it has to be, well, for, for certain you disorders, like, you know, like it has to be like... Yeah. body dysmorphia and how it affects you and your relationships with others, mm-hmm. you know, the whole transgenderism. You just define them as mentally ill. Do you know that? Yes. Mm, be careful. <laughs> right. Back to Newton. Those crazy bastards are going to come after you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Back to Newton. Uh, his the universal law of gravitation finally put to rest the Arist- uh, Aristotelian idea that um, uh, the that uh, terrestrial and celestial bodies are different. Um, so he kind of uh, mm, finally, right. you know, because Aristotle believed they were an entirely different substance, but he's like... Uh, yeah, I thought it, they were like celestial beings. Mm-hmm, like but Newton like was gods. finally like, no, they act in the same, you know, sort of laws of universal gravitation that everything else does. It's the right. same substance. Those are like big rocks up there. Yep. Rocks and gases. Moving on to the Labyrinth of the Continuum, which would be a great band name. Um, so Newton believed that space is an absolute entity... Uh, not a relation between bodies. So he thought space was a physical thing, uh, not so much, you know, uh, you know, because I would kind of say that space is, you know, the distance between me and you, whereas Newton would say that space is a physical thing that uh, objects exist in. And there are a few critics of this, uh, particularly Leibniz, uh, however you pronounce it. I say Leibniz. Leibniz. Yeah. Uh, he I believed... was not interested in this section at all. I thought I it was kind of interesting. I didn't like it. And I don't want to talk about it, but go ahead. I'll talk about it. Leibniz believed that space is something simply relative. It's just kind of a measurement. And then uh, there's also Thomas Clark, who believed that space and time belong to God, um, which is an interesting theory. Not entirely sure where he got that idea. He believed it was entirely something celestial, kind of, um, that put everything into existence. And so the continuum uh, was this big problem. It was the big problem at the time that since space is infinitely divisible, the bodies that occupy it must be infinitely divisible, um, so they must contain infinite parts. So that's how atoms would work, um, but everything would have to be infinitely divisible if there's infinitely small things. Uh, and so Anthony Kenny kind of points out here that they're, they kind of misunderstand the concept of infinity, and this is kind of where he points to the fact that it's a very much a shame that they kind of cast out Aristotle completely because they remove Aristotle's um, actuality and potentiality theory. Potentiality theory. Um, so they're, all of these scientists are kind of treating infinity as an actual thing that you can achieve, um, and that's where this big problem is. But uh, Aristotle always points to it's only potential thing. You know, you can only ever get closer to infinity. So in reality, you know, there is infinite things, but you're never actually getting to an infinite number of things because it's impossible. It's only a potential, not an actual thing. I hope our listener is not as bored as I am. Hume denied the infinite divisibility entirely. I have, I have an infinite amount of boredom at the talk 
of this subject. I thought it was kind of interesting. With really? as much as you said you like physics, this is like physics right here. Uh, All right. Well, I'm let's... talking about the continuum of infinities. It's like. All right, go ahead. That's all. Oh, you're all done. I have to say yes. All right. Going on to Kant. Kant's antinomies. Mm-hmm. Antinomies. I'm sorry. Did I talk you out of talking about that more? No, that was okay. it. That was all okay. I had to say. I'm tired. Did yes, I can talk? tell. I can very much I've tell. Had three bad nights of lack of sleep. Yes. And um, I'm just kind of surly about philosophy. And when, I, when I'm tired, I get surly about it. I think you just get surly about everything. Oh, there is that. <laughs> so Immanuel Kant uh, really believed. He put forth these. I become a skeptic. Yes. Yes. That's unfortunate. Isn't that what you don't like? The I skeptics. hate the skeptics. No, I'm, I'm a skeptic. Suck. I'm a skeptic tonight. So Immanuel Kant uh, put forth these antinomies, antinomies, whatever you want to call them. Um, which are you know these kind of misconceptions that people were really running with um, in terms of philosophy. Uh, so he believed there was a mistake to talk of the universe as a whole or treat space and time as having reality in themselves. So there's this big debate, you know, is the universe infinite? You know, when was it created? Uh, and, you know, the two big theories was either, you know, we can either, if the, if the universe is infinite, we can go back an infinite time and it has an end at one point right now, which I think is kind of, uh, something that you may have said uh, in kind of terms of God and that God is infinitely backwards, but he only works up to now the present. Um, that something could be infinitely backwards, but still have an end point. Yes. And then the opposite of that theory is either, you know, the world has an end point at the beginning and then it moves infinitely into the Forward. distance. Yeah, Correct. That's right. And so Kant just didn't care about either of these, basically. You know, it's pointless to think of the universe as a whole. You know, we can't really do that, you know, uh, especially when considering if, you know, space and time existed before creation, that sort of thing, you know, why should we point, put an end point, a beginning point on anything? You know, it's kind of just pointless to do so. Why do we care, basically? Then he also believed that, you know, it, it's pointless to treat space and time as having reality in themselves because he very much believed that they were very relative. It's just a way of mm-hmm. describing relations to things. They're not physical things that we can touch, you know. It's not something that we can actually, um, I guess, encompass uh, in one broad term. You know, it's just a relation between two things. Yeah, and I think, it, well, I guess unless you could... Um so to speak, travel in time, it's all so theoretical and to the point of meaningless of uh, whether or not there was a, a starting point for the earth or the universe. Unless you can somehow uh, accelerate time mm-hmm. or, or reverse it, what does it matter? Yeah, you that's know? kind of what he says. He says space right. and time just do not exist without a subject. You know, Correct. if you don't have anything right. in relation to space, anything in relation to time, then they don't exist at all. Right. right. So why does it really matter? Right. I, I think it's more interesting to 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 contemplate, like the, the investigate the prime substance. You know, like the smallest substance, the quarks, and all mm-hmm. those things that I haven't read about in many years. You know, as far as what's the smallest version of the atom? I mean, the atom is now large compared to how small they found different particles, but. I suspect that as you get smaller and smaller, you, it becomes more and more energy. Mm-hmm. And then you're just talking about like electro, electronic pulses at the... Uh, yeah, particles as, and as, waves as, and everything. Right, as as the fundamental building block of the physical is is really energy. Because mm-hmm. that's one of, one of the big questions right now. You know, is light a particle or a wave? You know, yeah. it operates in both ways depending on the circumstances. You know, do things change when we observe them? That sort of thing. So it's like... Will we ever really know uh, fully the answer? And so, I I, th- I think we'll know. Uh, I think on that, I agree with what you were saying earlier that it that we're we're going to progress towards that answer, mm-hmm. because I, I I tend to think without really having it. This is just off the cuff BS, but I tend to think that once they get down to finding what it, what will end up being the essence of matter, which is going to be essentially energy. That that will somehow explain how physical bodies can pull each other together mm-hmm. through gravity. It'll explain electromagnetic magnetic fields and how they are truly at their at their core what they are. Mm-hmm. Somehow that's all explained yeah. in there. And I mean, pro- there are many theories actually that I didn't kind of mention here. Um, you know, like the the atomist theory of Gassendi was that, you know, atoms have little hooks and kind of knobs right. on them. That's how right. things attract to each other. Right. Uh, I think Newton actually kind of believed that there was some sort of particle, mm-hmm. you know, some sort of invisible particle that drew things together. That the, was the what gravity ether. was. Yeah. Or the, it's A-E-T-H-E-R. The ether, the, yeah. Basically, like there's so like the uh, black energy that they, uh, or black mat, black, uh, black, black matter. dark matter, I think yes. is what it was called. 
that's like underlying everything across mm-hmm. the universe. And so there's not, in a, in a way they're saying there's not really a vacuum out there in space. Yeah. There's this dark matter out there that's filling in the void, which would explain, you know, their experiments determining how much mass there is in the universe and how that affects the gravitational pull of various mm-hmm. universes and all this. Yes. So what, what, what are your, what's your bottom line thoughts on the philosophy of physics in the, Early modern, is it early or this middle? Early modern. Early modern, modern age. I think it's interesting. I think it's very interesting to see how things progress here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I kind of just like learning the history of, you know, scientific theories. Yeah. It's like, you know, where did we come from? Where did we end up? True. Uh, this is the last time I think we'll be talking about physics. There's no, no physics in the yeah. modern uh, philosophy area because by that point, you know, physics is entirely separated from philosophy. There's no more. Um, right. you know kind of you know what inherent truths are there about right. the universe it's more of you know how can we experiment and look at things in this way yeah how do we figure out the facts i also thought it was very interesting just how much a lot of these philosophers just discredited math mm. which i thought was strange um, especially now now that you know all of our science is very much based around math entirely and not so much you know what inherent truths can we figure out ourselves mm. uh, it's very much completely observation based completely hypothesis that sort of thing is what we're kind of taught in school not so much that we can learn about physical matter just on our own we need you know to study it with math and science and all that sort of thing i don't know that they just discredited it do you think they well, did i don't i just I mean, don't think they, these, they valued it really several of these guys were mathematicians well i know but but at the beginning we're talking about you know uh, descartes you know only believed that you know we should only look to math as kind of an example for science not so much that mm-hmm. math is inherently part of it you know and bacon yeah. you know it's just an appendix to science you know it's not something that we inherently need for science which is very different from what is being taught now well i think well i guess i guess it depends on what you mean by science i, I think they were talking about what we would consider philosophy yeah like like uh bacon's more or less along the lines of mathematics is an appendix to philosophy you know as far as the meaning or the understanding of the nature of the world, I think he's wrong because I think, you know, math and Pythagoras would very much disagree with what that uh, math is just an appendix. Do you remember Pythagoras? Yeah. Yeah. Everything Everything is triangles. Right. Yes. Right. Three is a magic number. Thanks. That's what it is. Appreciate it. A man and a woman had a little baby. There were three in the family. Do you know that song? Yeah. It's Schoolhouse Rock, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Yes. That is. That's right. Yeah, but uh, it's also uh, dubbed into um, De La Soul's album. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Fun fact. All right. Do you have anything else to add about physics? Not really. Uh, uh, you know, like you said, it's an interesting subject mm-hmm. to a point, but it's like I, I'd, I'd rather talk about metaphysics yeah. in a philosophy. I do think it kind of falls uh, at some point in kind of the knowledge discussion, you know, right. what is really necessary to know on this topic. Right, right. Mm-hmm. I agree. Well, you can still follow us on Twitter at capital U, lowercase L-M-T-D, capital O, lowercase P-I-N-I-O-N-S. Omtid Opinions. So are you going to announce the t-shirt winner? Do we have somebody tweet at us? I have no idea. I don't think we've had oh, anyone tweet us. <laughs> I can check really quick. This will be... A- Sorry for another abrupt cut. He bumped the cord again. I'm checking the Twitter <laughs> right now. My apologies. Yes, that was very, very disappointing. It's important to apologize when you make a mistake. Remember that, Adam. Yes, yes, I, I'll, I'll remember that. Maybe you should share that uh, those words of wisdom with your mother. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic. I don't think the, that needs to be dragged on the podcast. The woman, the woman who refuses to apologize. Not that she has any reason to. You know, we have had absolutely no, um, no tweets at us. T- Twitter tweets. Nope. But you can still win a free T-shirt. Um, if you tweet something at us, the most interesting tweet will be given a free T-shirt that we still have not designed. It's been going on for like two months now. I've been thinking. I've been thinking. We're going to have a great design. Yeah, it'll be, we'll put a lot of thought into it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. Next week, we're talking about metaphysics. Thanks. That was fun. For who? For (laughs) all two of our listeners.